inspire. Welcome back to Start It Now. I'm your host, Jeff Saris. This is the show where I talk to entrepreneurs to reveal the unexpected paths to where they are today. Today, my guest is Jessica Yarmy. Jessica is a franchising expert. She's been doing this type of marketing and franchising work for decades now and has a an immense amount of experience. But in 2020, during the pandemic, she founded Kick House, which is a kick house, a kick house, a kickboxing. <laughs> You're over there laughing at me already. I, I always flub <laughs> something. So you got to get your laughs in. <laughs> I like laughing. Uh-huh, I like it. <laughs> but it is a kickboxing studio that is franchise based. They started with 30 locations. They've recently been acquired now two and a half in two and a half years in by uh, Floyd Mayweather's company, Mayweather Fitness and Boxing, I believe is the 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 full the full name of the company but this is a fascinating conversation i know nothing about franchising it's something i never even had considered so i was so grateful and am so grateful that jessica took the time to uh to help share her experience and knowledge so without further ado my conversation with jessica yarmy he just constantly puts out so much content and i'll be at the gym in the morning and i'm not listening to ACDC. I'm listening to Gary V's podcast and lifting at the same time. And I'm just learning and soaking it all up and trying to keep up with everything that he's like recommending. And, you know, he puts out so much content, 64 pieces of content a day. And I'm probably lucky if I put out three, but I'm at least like in that lane and I'm trying to think of it in that same way. And it just gives me daily inspiration. And so to meet him face to face and just have that moment was just my career could close tomorrow and I'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, that is the thing. It's sort of how we are the the sum of the people that we surround ourselves with. And interestingly, podcasts, I think, can sort of uh, scratch that itch a little bit, like not not in the same way, like uh, spending time with people in person, but having him having a lot of inspirational people in our ears, I think really helps sort of uh, set us on the right path for any given day. Like I, I'm right there with you. It, it means so much just to have someone like him, like just keeping, almost keeping me on track, even though he might not be uh, going for that specifically. Yeah, 100%. And it it almost um, prompts my, my my own content because whether it's Gary Vee's podcast or I listen to Science of Success, like I listen to your podcast now, it's like that prompts something in my mind that I'm working on in my world, which will either prompt a tweet if I can't like get a full thought around it, or it'll prompt a LinkedIn post. And then once I have the full thought around it, then I'll post to Medium and then I'll start that cycle again. You know, I share the medium to the Twitter, to the LinkedIn, you know, and it it really, a lot of it stems from what am I listening to? And the, the unlock for me that I think is, is so important that I try to like share with as many people as I can is I believe in garbage in, garbage out, whether it's nutrition, whether it's like exercise, whether it's what's in your mind, like truly what's, what are you putting into your ears. And if it's sad songs every day, you're going to be in a funk. If it's, um, you know, ACDC, great. You're going to be in like a slay the day kind of, kind of mindset, but I don't slow down enough to read. And so for me having like the podcasts is that moment of learning. And it is that moment of maybe it's in the background, but something is said that it unlocks that thought in my mind and it takes my thinking to that next level yeah have you always been someone going 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 like from a young age i have always struggled with reading and for a while i forced myself into it and i forced myself to to sit and i tried to to share that like here's all the books i read in you know 20 Mm -hmm. you know 2002 and I think there's that um, culture of like, if you want to be a great CEO, you should read 65 books a year. And 
it's November 10th. I have completed zero books this year, front to back, like zero. And I think what's helped me succeed in my career is knowing how my brain works and knowing I have this level of ADD and almost allowing that to be a superpower and allowing that to to be, okay, we're talking about marketing one second. Okay, wait, this studio has a problem, like jump over here, do this. Now I have to do this. Maybe I'm on a Zoom call and I'm tweeting somebody at the same time. Like I'm constantly like multitasking and, and moving around. So I think so much of what schools are missing these days is is teaching people how to to understand their own learning style, their own thinking style, and to work within their strengths instead of trying to shoehorn yourself into something that maybe society or maybe Inc. Magazine tells you that you should be doing because you want to be a founder or you want to be an amazing CEO. Yeah, like I so relate to that because the I get so much done before 6 a.m. blah 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 sort of that like cliche like approach isn't me I've always been a night owl and it got to the point I had to realize like this is me I need to lean into that and realize I get more done after 6 p.m. than most people do in a day like that's just my version of what that means and I think it's so important to to reflect and know who we are was there anything that really um, maybe allowed you to to really look internally and realize that about yourself? I think I just ended up maybe by luck putting myself into a career path that had a lot of tasks within it. And so any any up and coming marketing career, you're you're working on emails one second, and then maybe you're in social media, then maybe you're jumping over to a website, maybe then you're writing copy, maybe then you're answering a vendor's question, like it's kind of organically this role that like has to jump and move. And so going into college, I was a marketing major, and then coming out, I was in those kind of roles and started to have success in those kind of like churning through in a lot of different areas kind of um kind of functions and the unlock for me was taking that kind of function and then putting it into a fitness space which is what i was passionate about so it's how my mind works layered with what i love to do layered with people layered with franchising like there's so many parts of my day that are difficult, but still so great that I don't hit that point of, of burnout really, because it's still fun at the end of the day. Like sometimes I do need to take that step back to see the fun, you know, you get too deep into your things sometimes and you get overwhelmed, but it's not the like burnout sensation that some people would have if they're working 12 hour days. Um, because if you're working in something you you love, make it a 14 hour day and you're still good, you know? And so I put a lot of time into my work. I put a lot of time into what I do even for my personal brand. And um, I think that's the way I've been able to stay sane with it is just by also putting myself into a career that I really love. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. You're spending your days solving problems. And would you say a lot of them, what would you say maybe the, the ratio is like difficult problems versus sort of the, the mundane problems to some, everything has its own sort of level to it, you know? It's so much difficult stuff. Um, <laughs> and I, it's almost intentional, right? Like I try to push myself to the edges of my comfortability and that's where the growth is. So I know I need to be there um, and I want to level up and I want to be the best CEO that I can be. So I'm constantly in those fires trying to learn and figure it out. The way that I balance out those fires is I'm a creative person by nature. I'm a fun person by nature. And so if I have that fire that I need to really dive in and focus on, I'll give myself those little brain breaks on the front and back end of that project to um, just have that little reset. So for me, like 
I, I have a TikTok that I'll post about my business and I'll post silly things and kind of be a little bit ridiculous. I'm on Twitter pretty heavy talking about Web3 and NFTs. And those are my moments of I know how to tweet, you know, so I don't know how to deal with this fire. I don't know if I'm handling it correctly or the best way that it should be handled, but I know how to tweet. So I'm just going to give myself that breather. I'm still on my path. You know, I'm still like churning out stuff for me and for my business, but it's just a lower uh, intensity um, deliverable. So I put like low intensity, high intensity, low intensity, high intensity. So my day is again, like it's just tricks you play with yourself to like make your day manageable. And I like saying it that way, because I mean, you're describing interval training, but for for work and content creation, which I hadn't thought about it that way. But that's brilliant. I love that. Well, and and again, I think it just goes to like understanding how your brain works and understanding, okay, if I give myself this little reset, it's going to make that next big lift feel a little bit more manageable. So yeah, it absolutely parallels to fitness and so much of work parallels to fitness, which, you know, is why I, I think I love both because you can, you can take learnings from either and, and apply it to, to the opposite. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think the, having the rich, deep problems to solve keeps us engaged too. Because if it was sort of the everything's easy, quote unquote easy, takes time and everything. But if all the problems were easy, suddenly we lose that drive. And I think that um, plays in a lot to um, uh, burnout and things like that because we're not actually satisfied in any given day. Yeah, and learning is so critical for me. And Mm -hmm. like I already said, I don't I don't learn via reading. I learn via getting in there, doing it, probably messing half of it up, you know, and like doing it better the next time around. So I think, you know, this generation that's coming through as they're talking about like the quiet quitting and, um, you know, the great resignation that was happening last year. I think to your point, so much of it is maybe boredom or so much of it is I'm not feeling fulfilled in this current role. And so I'm going to go find that that challenge um, in the next place. Yeah. So you've been doing marketing, franchising for a long, for your whole career. What was the point maybe in your career or earlier when you realized this is, this is what I want to pursue as an entrepreneur rather than like working in the industry, you're taking all your, all your knowledge, all your vast experience and applying it to something that like, that's a big leapfrog, you know, because that is, it's, it's a daunting task to jump out on our own, no matter where we're at in life. I I love that question because um, I never saw it coming. And as I talk to people and they're in goal setting mode and they're, you know, mapping out their vision board or putting their five year plan together, or <laughs> setting their New Year's resolutions or whatever. I sometimes tell people, like, leave room for that thing that you don't you don't expect you don't see it coming, but when it hits your desk, when it hits your phone, when it, when it hits your world, you can be like, oh heck yeah, that's the right thing to do. And I think there's so many of us that get stuck in these linear career paths. We get stuck in this linear thinking. We get stuck in maybe what's, what is society telling me the next step is the next step is to get married. And then I have a kid and then I have another kid, you know, and there's so many different ways you can slice life and you can slice your career and don't, don't dial in your goals so specifically that you, that you might oversee something that's like that no brainer, perfect next step for you, but you'd never really thought about it. And, and that's truly what took me into entrepreneurship. It was the beginning of the pandemic and I was in a CMO role, um, working in boutique fitness and, the pandemic to me was just a like a seismic shift in the environment and there was a lot of headlines that was like when is this when is when are things going to return to normal and i really from the beginning saw it as like especially in fitness like this is a shift there's not going to be a return to normal and so as things move around there's going to be opportunity i don't know what it's going to be but there's going to be an opportunity there's going to be like 
a club closing near my house that I, you know, like there's going to be something that like happens that I have to like be ready to jump on. And, um, and kick house really became that, that opportunity that I never saw coming. But as soon as it hit my world, I was like, absolutely. We're doing this. No looking back, um, no fear and let's go. Yeah. So how did it hit your world? Um, I'm a big fan of being connected in fitness. Um, I'm a fan of staying connected with people on LinkedIn and, um, you know, that, that phrase of like, don't burn your bridges. I think it's like, don't burn your good bridges. And I have had such an amazing career of meeting so many great people who have been connectors for me throughout my career. And, um, this was an introduction from, you know, a contact who was connected, you know, contacted about this role and, um, you know, or about the opportunity and it wasn't the right time for him. And he said, well, I'm not the right person, but you should call Jessica. And, um, and that's really how it started. And like many things, um, it, once it starts, it like sometimes can happen really fast and you blink and you're like, wait, I'm founding a company. What, what's, <laughs> you know, what's exactly <laughs> happening? How did we get to this moment? But again, there wasn't that big decision moment. It was um, it was clear as day. Like this is absolutely what I should be doing in this moment. This is the the challenge that I was looking for. This is what I'm ready for. And you know, people are saying like, "Oh, is, wasn't it risky to start a fitness concept during a pandemic?" And my thought is always, "Sure, there's risk, but there's risk." to just sit in my old role and play it safe also. You know, you kind of have that opportunity cost of like, what am I missing out on if I just sit still and play it safe? Yeah, that agility is vital. Being able to recognize it and then run with it because it's so easy. You could have seen it and been like, oh, that's something that sounds good. We'll talk later. We'll push it off. And then opportunities dry up like time, like windows. We, we talked a little about NFTs. Like that's a different market now. It's a different window of time. And Having the the uh, having looked internally and realizing like no this is who I am how I operate and then applying that to different opportunities and ones that fit trying it out experimenting is just it's just so important. So yeah, and I know there's a lot of people that are dealing with layoffs now, mm -hmm. and I think the point that you just made is exactly how you navigate a layoff. You know, you stay agile. You contact as many people as you can about what you're trying to do. And you keep that open mind of like, what does somebody have on their desk as an opportunity that you might have never considered, but it got to you because you made that call of like, hey, I just got laid off. I'm looking for my next step. You know me, you've worked with me before. Anything, you know, keep your eyes and ears open. That's how the best the best roles are found. Mm -hmm. Yeah, literally like that. That is exactly what happened to me. It was like 2009. I lost my job, reached out to people I had already been helping, put me in contact with certain things that just happened. And since then, it's like everything we do is word of mouth. Like it's just, it's that who you know and what you know. Like if you're, if you're not good at what you do, you can know everyone, but there's a problem there. But if, if there's that mat, that match, things can be just, uh, can work so well and just click together put together so yep, well absolutely so when you started when you got that first uh like oh i'm gonna run with this what were some of the first steps because this is a this is a franchise and i know this is your world this is why i sort of want to poke on it too because i know nothing about franchising but mm -hmm. i find it so fascinating and also so in my in my vision of it so daunting because it's such a grand approach to starting a business so what were maybe some of the first steps for you and being like, okay, I know I want to do this. I want to jump on board. I want to found this company. Where do you even maybe begin? Yeah, and I think I think your point about it being daunting is, yes, it absolutely was daunting. But I started in franchising in 2008. I started in fitness in 2012. And so there's like years that are leading up to this moment. And Sure, it's a pandemic and all of those playbooks kind of went out the window, but it it was less daunting because I had been in it for as long as I had been um, in a different role, certainly, but um, it wasn't like a very 
like the brand new fresh like take at at you know at mm-hmm. franchising i knew enough about the business model to like start to build it um i was lucky to have a business partner who has superpowers in legal finance contract negotiation and so a lot of the the franchise formation really starts on the legal side and it starts on creating your FDD and putting together like massive legal documents. And he really took that and owned that piece. Thank goodness. Because to me, like paperwork is daunting and reading is daunting, like we already talked about. So for me, my first steps were like sitting in my superpowers, which are like, what are we going to call this thing? What is it going to look like? What is it going to sound like? What is it going to feel like? And the daunting part of that was um, creating a brand and not really having a lot of people to bounce it off of because it needed to move so quickly and it needed to really be built before the franchise was built. So there was almost like a, like what comes first, the chicken or the egg. And we really had to like reverse order on a lot of things. And, you know, we built the brand you know, I named it, I filed the trademarks, um, you know, wrote the tagline myself and, you know, built the logo with a graphic designer that I had worked with before. And all of this is being done. And I definitely had those moments of looking at it and saying like, okay, I like this, but are other people going to like it? And um, the proudest thing for me is just to sit here today, two and a half years into it and and realize how many people do like it and and not just like it, but they really love it. And they've taken it and made it their own and they've put their own fingerprints onto the brand and and they've really like embraced it and made it into so much bigger of a thing than than I could have on my own. And I think that's a lesson that I learned in in brand building. I am I almost left um I left a lot of space in the brand almost by accident because I had to, because I didn't have time. And so there's a lot of like white space to it. And I think that's really what helped people um, connect to it is they could almost just like see it as something that like they could fit into in a way. Um, When you say that, that's odd to think about, but (laughs) oh no, when you say that though, what do you mean, sort of, about leaving white space within a brand? I I think some uh, some brands, if you look at mature brands, um, they're doing so many things. There's like so many different icons, and there's so many different words and taglines, and and every single bit of it is is so full and you know, you, you walk into, uh, you know, like a yogurt shop and there's like colored tiles and then there's like graphics above the tiles and everything's like so intentionally busy to give you this like energy and positivity about the place. And, and we really had to like, again, almost by necessity, like leave a lot of space, physical space, leave a lot of things like there's just a lot of room for the for the brand to to breathe even on social media it's like the way that we show our brand visually it has a lot of breathing room um and i think what that does is it allows somebody who is you know maybe not feeling 100% comfortable like starting their fitness journey but like they walk into this place and they're like okay you know what like that's not scary like it's fine and um it's worked out really well from a standpoint of um, like people have just like taken the the brand and like made it made it theirs, which again, I wish I like intentionally did. I really unintentionally did it, but it had that amazing um, like outcome, which, you know, again, I'm I'm it's the most proud that I have about, about starting the whole thing is like how people have connected to it. Um, and the, the community and the culture that like surrounds the brand today that I really like couldn't have ever like dreamt up in July of 2020. Yeah. So what are some of the things about the culture and like the community that have surprised you? 
I am very much a control freak by nature, perfectionist, and I'm a doer on my own. And obviously starting a business from scratch, there's um, there's so much that's daunting and there's just so many things to do. And very early on, again, probably by, by lesson learned by mistake, um, I just learned that I couldn't get it all done myself. And I had to tag in people and I had to ask for help and I had to involve people in the building of it. And again, uh, someone unintentionally, but like what that did was create like buy-in around what we were building because I gave people pieces to build and asked for their help and gave it to them to own and said like, Hey, it's not, I don't even know what to do with this. Just take it and run with it and do it. And they did. And in a lot of ways, they probably did better than what I would have done. So the culture then is one of ownership, one of creating, one of building, one of collaboration, one of um, owning the fact that this is going to be messy at times and it's okay and we're going to fail. It's okay. And like, are we still at the end of the day, like able to say that we put a full effort in? And if so, great. You know, like that's, that's the biggest thing to be able to say as a startup is like, is that your culture? So I would put our culture side by side with any company's culture. Um, it's, it's really like collaboration, a lot of work, um, and, and just a lot of like pride of work also, and like pride around creation and pride around mission. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you basically, you've given, uh, you've empowered people by sort of a compass. You've set them in the direction, like you maybe, you have a spark that starts everything off, but there isn't like a set path. Like none of this is ever a set path from where you started to here versus like moving forward. It's so, uh, your agility is what, what shows and why things are thriving so well. How were how were you maybe um, as you were bringing people in? So through your network, it sounds like connecting with people who, who you've met in the past. How were you maybe calibrating that? Like because you're giving them the freedom, but at the same time, how do you convey maybe the little little tidbits of what what you envision without mm -hmm. really putting the rails on them? Yeah, um, I think it is it is a exercise of setting rails, and it's setting like if it's too far over here check in with me if it's too far over here check in with me but if it's here and you have and you're confident you know what to do great go run you might trip it's okay i'll help you get back up it's fine speed is more important than than perfection um so early on in onboarding it's just having those moments of like here's where the guardrails are and in a lot of instances, the people that I hire, they wanted to be even tighter guardrails. Like they want my final approval on things or they want my opinion on things. And it really was me to push out the guardrails to say, listen, like there's things I don't know either. And we're all just like in this trying to figure it out. So make your best decision, go learn, check in with me if it gets too far over here. And um, I think that's been an interesting like adjustment for some of them coming into a startup culture, maybe from a different culture is like, again, in startup mode, speed is more important than than perfection because we'll iterate, we'll we'll do it better the next time we we revise it. Um, and my other like fun hack for that is just to hire people who are fresh out of school or it's their first role. And you put them into a pace and they don't realize it's like an abnormal pace. Like Delaney, my marketing director, is uh, it's her first role. And I laugh with her about that all the time because she's so well prepared for whatever her next like role is going to be. And it's going to seem so slow to her <laughs> when she gets to that point um, because we've just brainwashed her from day one that this is totally normal. All of the chaos, it's totally normal. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, I do like that. And someone who hasn't gotten also maybe uh, conditioned along 
a conventional we talked about like conventional paths before like at the very beginning but the conventional like work system which a lot of times unfortunately is like look like you're busy like look like you're busy for so many hours in a lot of scenarios at least like that was was my experience so yeah it's it's more valuable for the employee too like she now has this like understanding of how to really make things happen yeah and and everyone's working way above their their titles everyone's working way outside of exactly what their roles and responsibilities are supposed to be because it's all toward like what's the end all be all goal and okay i see that there's this piece over here that someone needs to deal with and we have that culture of like whatever it takes okay i know enough about that i'll pick it up and and try to run with it yeah for sure so starting a franchise are you starting with a single sort of proof of concept um, because you, you had to lead up for all the brand and sort of developing that brand. But mm -hmm. how does the physical in-person stuff start to come into play? Yeah, the the traditional way of starting a franchise is to build one to prove that it works and then to file your franchise disclosure document and then to file your franchise agreement and then to start getting, you know, franchisee number one essentially builds out studio number two. Um, you know, sometimes you build five corporate owned and then you franchise. So we just dove right into to the deep end. And, you know, I think, again, as we talk about the pandemic and maybe like the looming recession, um, there's there's environmental shifts at times that um, open up opportunities to think outside of traditional playbooks and boxes. And it's it's funny to me reading the headlines these days about like the recession and how bad like everything's going to get. And like my entrepreneur brain is just going and seeing the exact same moment that I saw really in July of 2020, where, listen, we could get this done. It's not going to be the traditional way, but like we can do it. And the same kind of opportunities are going to exist over the next six to 12 months as like different people navigate the, the looming recession in like in different ways. So I think part of having like a 21 year uh, career leading into this moment is like you learn the playbooks, you learn the traditional ways, you learn the rules, and then you have that moment of like, wait, I can, I can probably break that and do this, or I can like go outside of the box and get this done. And that's really like how we grew was just to, to grow totally differently than a traditional franchise would grow. Yeah. So how many did you start with and how many locations? We jumped to 30 fairly quickly because <laughs> of essentially like rebranding studios that already existed. And, you know, again, as I'm looking at like heading into a possible recession, the same exact opportunity exists where like, are you in an industry that's so fragmented where a single owner of one location could benefit from the air cover that a national brand could provide them? And, um, you know, I, again, I think there's, there's, there's different ways to look at, um, at environmental shifts, like the ones that we're in right now. And like Warren Buffett said, like, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. And it's exactly that kind of moment again. And some people will still miss that opportunity because they will be like frozen by that fear or they'll want to play it safe and or they won't have the the ability to like take a risk and and I think that's what the greatest takeaway from these last 2 years should be for everyone is like if you're smart you you're able to like watch what's happening you're able to see the opportunities and you have enough knowledge and maybe resources to pull from to take advantage of those opportunities 
Yeah, and I hadn't thought about the rebranding of existing studios and things. That is that actually does just sort of it's a little unlock in my brain because I hadn't thought about that initially, but it makes perfect sense because at that time too, I'm sure it wasn't even as maybe hard of a sell of sorts because it's the pandemic. Everything was shut down. Everything is changing. So that is a nice uh, little rapid on ramp. So is that sort of is that model then being applied to Prime to Prime Yoga? I would love to pull that off. Um, so if anyone out there is listening and you own either a boxing studio or a kickboxing studio or a yoga studio, and you'd like to work together, like reach out to me. But I think um, if you're, if you're someone who loves yoga and you have started a yoga studio, um, your, your heart is in the, in the modality. It's in the practice of doing yoga. It's not on the business side. And so then you're being put into a situation where you have to navigate, um, lockdowns, vaccination requirements, capacity limitations, um, PPP loans, all of that is so daunting. And that's why many of them closed. And so for those that are still open, um, we're about to hit another moment of like, okay, let's navigate really intentionally. And um, it's time to be smart. It's not time to be afraid. It's time to be smart. Um, And oftentimes where you have a collective, you're able to be smarter, not just because of collective resources, but from collective brain power and just having different people able to like sit in different superpowers and really build the best possible strategy to navigate what's needed. Yeah. And I like that because you're basically taking taking things off their plate that aren't their strengths. Basically, I assume. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a right. great approach. Exactly. Yeah. And again, I think that play exists still in fitness. Um, I think that play exists in other industries as well. Um, and we're still in that moment where people are going to need that kind of play to to navigate through the next six to 12 months. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything uh, specifically that you think people should be looking out for, whether it's franchising or sort of like with the opportunity that you're seeing again, it, is there anything that just sort of comes to mind that's like, oh, if you start to, uh, you're noticing this trend. Um, this is such a, a vague, a broad question. I'm sorry. This is like an awful question to ask. But is there something that maybe someone listening who maybe isn't into franchising that they could take away of right. like, oh, I should think in this uh, in this direction? Well, I'm thinking how to answer that because I think there's like, what do you do in the next six months? But but where my brain goes is like, what is the what's the 12 month play or what's the 24 month play? And I think. Um, as I'm talking to more and more people about web three opportunities, I see so much um, opportunity, especially right now to like dig into that space and learn and understand how will like decentralized platforms affect your business and really any business that's collecting money, um, any business that collects email addresses, like you're going to be impacted by this technology. And so where there's this time of like shifts, um, especially downturns in the crypto market in the NFT market, it's like the perfect time to to try to understand and learn what's going on. You can buy an NFT for ten cents. You know, it, it, it's an easy price of entry right now, as opposed to last year at the same time. Um, but I think there's there's so many opportunities that are going to unlock in web three and like, maybe this is that moment where it's like that, that collision of environmental forces that almost like, um, force people to like, start going down that path. Um, but I think in the near term, there's going to be businesses up for sale. There's going to be businesses that you can walk into for zero dollars. Um, there's going to be so many opportunities in, in the brick and mortar space because there are today. So why wouldn't there be two months from now when maybe the recession is more, um, like clear cut that we're actually in this recession. But I think what's 
what's interesting is you like you have to consume from a variety of sources. You have to consume like what is the news telling you? You have to consume like what's happening at my target. And re- what's happening at my target right now is like they're just stacking up flat screens for Black Friday. So like I'm going to be watching what's happening on Black Friday. How does Black Friday spend compared to last year? How does it compare to 2020 when we were first year of the pandemic? And understand like our consumers really feeling that pinch that the headlines say they are, or is it really, you know, there's like leading indicators and lagging indicators. And, and to me, maybe like flat screen purchases are a, are a leading indicator that like, we're going to be okay. We're all going to make it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Excuse me. In the web three sort of terms, you know, it's perfect. Yeah, exactly, exactly. What does your media consumption look like then? Because I really like that looking at your local target, like localizing how you're looking at the economy and where people are moving. What does your maybe broad uh, intake of that kind of information look like? I am big on Twitter, um, but I really consume my Web3 and NFT uh, kind of news in, in Twitter and I don't stay on the news trending topics too much. Um, but I do, I do follow social media because I'm, you know, a marketer by nature. So I'm looking at like, where are people spending their time? I'm on TikTok right now, really trying to like learn that platform and understand it. And I think, um, you can learn by like looking backward also. And I think as I look at the brands that, were late to TikTok or still are late to TikTok. And those same brands are waiting on like, what, what am I going to do for web three? How is this brand going to show up in the metaverse? And they're waiting. And at some point as a brand, you're going to get passed by, by the brands that just up and go. And so I'm a big fan of the the like up and go kind of approach, which I think is what like connects me to the web three culture is like, let's just build and learn and go um, and not have it figured out perfectly. And um, so I I think there's so much to, there's so much to consume and there's so many like smart people out there, but I think it's just, it's watching from a variety of, of perspectives and taking in the the positive headlines and taking in the negative headlines and understanding like the reality is probably going to fall somewhere in the middle. And is there an opportunity for me in that middle case scenario? Yeah. So with Web3 then in your business, are there things that you're thinking about right now moving towards that you could talk about not to... Uh, break down any 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 alpha right now but like if there's something like how are you looking at everything um because you already do have an nft for uh kick house yeah i mean it's interesting because i do talk about it a lot and i'm not really afraid of talking about it because um because even when i say it no one like listens you know or <laughs> well an execution like, I'll tell them execution is everything yeah, so just an like, idea is is free it's just an idea yeah. I mean, so, so truly like what my, what my big thought is right now is like, how does Kick House show up in, in a metaverse kind of environment? And are we in a sandbox or decentral land as a storefront, or are we in our own metaverse because we have our own existing customer base, or are we in a fitness metaverse where Kick House exists plus Prime plus Mayweather plus, you know, plus, plus, plus. And, and we kind of all align together and say, we have the people. Uh, Web3 right now doesn't have the people. So if we aligned and joined forces and said, um, let's put our communities into the same metaverse environment, that's a real opportunity um, if you, if you can turn off that, that competitor's mindset of like, I want to, I want to compete against everyone and win, but that's a real, that would be a real win for the fitness industry. And then that would be a real win, I think for our society as a whole, which is, you know, has 
obesity levels that are higher than they've ever been, physical activity levels that are lower than they've ever been, and underserved populations that really keep on getting more um, as a contrast, like left out of a lot of the resources that some of the wealthier areas have. So if we could align and build in a way that then also provides access via a metaverse environment to someone who's living in, you know, a a project somewhere that doesn't have the money to attend a boutique fitness studio, but they have access to it virtually, like that's huge. So those are the kind of things that like keep me up at night and just that I'm thinking of, because I know it's very doable, but it takes egoless involvement and and it takes brands willing to sit side by side with brands that have maybe historically been competitors and sit side by side with them knowing that like we together are stronger than we are apart especially as we enter web3 because then we have apple that's going to come in with an even bigger sledgehammer than than we're ready to deal with so like can we combine forces? Can we combine superpowers, combine, you know, put client lists into the same metaverse environment? And like, that's mind blowing to a lot of people. But if we built it, um, it, it really could change like a lot of things for a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, that sounds brilliant to me, like really joining forces and not uh, reinventing the wheel. For each of these brands to try and go ahead and start from scratch is huge. But if there is an umbrella where like you go to like you go to a, a mall and there's a bunch of stores, it's somewhat similar. Like you go to uh, XYZ Metaverse and this is where I can choose the, the studio I want to go to, the this, the that, the the um the trainers, the whatever it is. Like I really like that. Is anyone is there anything even remotely like that in existence yet? Other than because like sandbox and things are very uh, broad. I didn't think fitness related. No, there's not. And this is honestly the first time that I've talked about it publicly, but I've talked to a number of people directly about it. And and I know that, I know that we could do it. Um, it would just take a few early movers who have that egoless approach and have that, um, you know, that, that can see it as a bigger picture and not see it as a competitive space. Like take the same content you have on YouTube basically, and let's build it into like a metaverse kind of structure as a starting point. Like let's just start there and make it accessible to people. Um, because in fitness, we talk about reaching, the 81% of Americans who don't work out at all, but we see it as they must come to us. And I think where I'm trying to get people to like move to mentally is let's go to them. They're on their couch. They're in front of their TV. They're in front of their computer. Let's just start there. And the big step is, okay, they get comfortable with it online in the metaverse and then they walk into the studio and it kind of feels like home because they've kind of been there but just virtually it's there it's like very possible and it's very much something that could help someone make that that positive change that they really like have been struggling to make in their in their world yeah absolutely and it it bolts into sort of the fitness world where it's at now perfectly because it's almost like peloton like you, you have your mm -hmm. trainers and things that you would choose from what I get. I've never used it, but like you sort of pick the people you want to do, you want to do the different courses and, and whatnot, but it then can be the other direction where you're, you don't need the expensive bike. You don't need the, maybe the same level of equipment, but then that can funnel you into, oh, I'd love to go there Tuesday this week, rest of the week I'm doing this, but being able to go somewhere, that's yeah. a huge like unlock. Like, like, there's something really special right there. Yeah. And the reality is it's not about the workout that mm -hmm. makes people not go. Um, it's the, it's the fear and it's the what ifs and it's the intimidation and it's the, I won't fit in and I don't know what to expect. And 
will I look silly? Will I look dumb? No one wants to look dumb. No one wants to feel silly. And so even if it's like simply come in, look at it, watch one of those. You don't even have to do the workout. Like just watch so that you understand, like, here's generally what happens. And oh, by the way, it's a friendly face on the screen. And oh, by the way, like, here's what you're going to see when you walk into the building. And can we take that first step of fear out of the equation? Because once they're in the four walls, whether it's at kick house or anywhere else, once they're in the four walls, like, all of fitness has that goal of like, we've got you from there. And we need more people to make that first step. Yeah. Yeah. I really like it. I, we're coming up almost on time. So I just, I want to, I want to talk about the Mayweather acquisition because I think that's super fascinating. Um, but yeah, I really, this is going to be on my mind for a bit. So I'm definitely going to want to follow along and see if you start running with it and how you, uh, how you build it out, because that is a huge opportunity. And like you said, it's, it's coming to, the person and helping Mm -hmm. them like that's really why i think that everything you're saying sounds so valuable because it's helping the person do the thing they they want to do like we all want to be healthier we want to be fit we want to feel good in our skin but there are those just natural things that hold us back from from taking that leap from showing up to the gym from with whatever it is yeah I really like that. Yeah, don't worry. I'll I'll be calling you with my production questions. <laughs> oh, hey, that works. <laughs> I'm always happy to help in any way that I can. But um, the one last thing I just wanted to talk then about Mayweather, like Floyd Mayweather's. Um, I forget exactly the phrase, uh, what the actual company is called of his. Um, but he's acquired Mayweather Boxing and Fitness. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he's actually acquired uh, Kickhouse then, huh? Or that company has. Yeah, so we've combined resources, we've merged together, and it's a fascinating partnership because I talked a lot about superpowers already, like everything that they're really good at and superpowered at is things that we weren't good at, and vice versa. And so it's been an interesting, like, you know, collision of strengths, if you will, to like navigate that like merger and and put people in places where they can really thrive and and leverage people resources time resources etc that that we never had access to as kick house so um i think it's really exciting for like to think about the next even six months together um since we've been merged we've signed a number of uh, new franchise agreements already simply on the like announcement so i think um there's nothing but like upside to come and and it's not going to take 24 months to see that upside it's going to take three months and it's going to be like in front of people's faces like wow look at that now yeah so um it's really exciting and and it's more learning for me more challenges for me but i'm i'm ready for it yeah i mean it sounds amazing. Just it'll open up so much. And was that something you pursued? Did they come to you? How does that sort of uh, come about? Yeah, a little bit of both. I mean, we were pursuing funding really for our business just to help get to the next level um, and really help navigate, you know, a pandemic that dragged on a whole lot longer than than anybody would have anticipated. Um, in franchising, it really is you're kind of seen as proven when you hit 50 locations and we were having trouble getting to that like quantity of studios and it was just slow to grow during the pandemic. And so overnight with that deal signed, we just grew from 30 studios to almost a hundred. So um, I think those are the kind of things that people should start to look for as this like recession moment is going on. Like, are there, are there organizations that you could partner with, collaborate with that there's going to be mutual benefit? There's gain gain on both sides because you're probably both feeling pain individually. And so can you alleviate some pain points by by combining together? And that's not just in the fitness space. Like in any industry, there's going to be those opportunities if you're open to it and if you like have that egoless approach to your business. Yeah. Yeah. It's a win-win creating a win-win at any level. So valuable. And it's, 
like those complete businesses that are based purely on that and taking things off of someone else's plate. And yeah. I yeah, really, there's going to be acquisition opportunities, mergers, like all of that. So I think um, if there's any takeaway from this this episode, it's like, don't be fearful. Be really, really smart and watch and listen because there's opportunities out there, but you have to be like, you have to see them, you have to hear about them and you have to be ready for them. Yeah, absolutely. And I just really want to thank you for taking the time. Like, this is this is awesome. And being like an area that I have no uh, experience or knowledge and really like I love that it's that just uh, stretching the boundaries getting to that edge and be like okay what I don't know what I don't know so let's start start rolling with this but but anyway not to take any more of your time where should we send people to uh, see everything just everything you're doing you can learn more about kick house at the kickhouse.com or all of our social is either at kick house or at the kick house and then my social is always at Jessica army I want to thank Jessica for joining me on this episode. Be sure to check everything out that she's up to. She is uh, prolific on social media. She's built the platform. We really didn't even talk about content creation, which was um, something I had planned on talking about more, but there was just way too much to talk about in this in this convo. But be sure to check out Kickhouse and uh, Jessica Yarmy all over all over the socials. But yeah, you had a you enjoy it over there too. And you're always laughing at me. I swear. <laughs> You give me a lot to laugh at. Okay, good. No, I'm <laughs> In <glad>. a good way. <laughs> but yeah, I'm the metaverse. I loved hearing about all of it. I took down a couple notes just for me and all my business, new business ventures this mm-hmm. year. Uh, yeah, she's a wealth of knowledge. I was like, I want to talk to you just like, I don't know. Wish we were closer in location. I don't even know where she is, but I wish we were closer in location. Uh huh. Well, so. yeah. Yeah, there's so much. <laughs> and um, the agility so important oh yeah specifically though the thing that's gonna be like just sort of scratching at my brain right now is the web3 metaverse for um fitness same studios. i seriously wrote down something about that because i was like that is such a fascinating like we seriously are at the beginning of web3 and nfts and i was already trying to think with all of my own nft collections what i could offer to people with that like mm-hmm. make something even greater which we do have some ideas so stay tuned oh yeah but, but not to plug my own stuff this is your show but a you huge know, opportunity i looked really big whoa uh-huh. look at whoa. that <laughs> ah. anyway. yeah this is amara andrew <laughs> and you can uh find her stuff at amaraandrew.com amara big hands andrew <laughs> 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 including uh the nft project uh the dowers and the spoopies so you didn't want to plug but i gotta say what you're doing <laughs> As I'm over here, like, look how big my hand is. But anyway, anyway, <laughs> this has been started now. I'm Jeff Saris. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye.